Oh, okay. So this lesson is on um, interior angles of polygons. It sort of fits into the sequence that we've been teaching. We've kind of started with parallel lines, uh, interior angles of triangles. We've proven a lot of the uh, angle relationships within those triangles and within those shapes. I think we did, uh, we did quadrilaterals recently, so we're kind of building up. There's a lot of, of topics in between those topics, so it's not like it goes exactly in sequence. Um, and so the next logical step, or the next step, is interior angles of polygons. I think the actual standard is something about area of polygons, which we are going to do next. But in order to calculate the area of many of these polygons, you do need the little triangles that are inside them, which of course require the angles. You've got to get those special right triangles and all that stuff. So it kind of fits into the, the progression that we've been, uh, been going along. Yeah, so we kind of talked about that a little bit with the, uh, the angles. For this one, the, the sequence for this chapter, I guess, I guess you can call them chapters. We have the, the new um, state curriculum, which I actually helped create parts of, not this one specifically. Um, but the main idea for this is, like I said, interior angles, exterior angles, and then uh, area. And so those are basically the, the four lessons. It's interior this time, next time we will do exterior, and then the following two, two lessons, there's like a little project it's like area of the floor of a house or something like that. Um, so basically for this lesson, the objective that I have for the students is uh, all the polygons up to 10, so I guess 3 to 10, knowing the sum of the interior angles uh, and then being able to apply that or use that skill to find missing pieces. So if you just give them, you know, in an octagon, you give them seven angles, find the, the eighth angle or in a regular octagon, find one of the missing angles. Or, and we'll try this at the end, I don't know how far we'll go, but uh, what if you stick, like, stick a triangle on top of an octagon? Can you find kind of the resulting angles from that? So that's the main focus for this. Um, try to stay away from exterior. It sort of overlaps, of course, but um, that's kind of the, the place that we're going after this. So um, we have the project. So that'll be in a couple weeks, kind of the end thing. That's the, the sort of larger summative assessment. Um, throughout the class, um, I'll be walking around, checking to see you know, for individual problems, what are they doing? What, what strategies are they using? What mistakes might they be making? Um, I try, we'll see how the time goes. I try to get a couple kids to, uh, to show their work. Um, I teach off of the iPad, and I will just hand it to a kid. I found it's a lot better or a lot more comfortable for a lot of kids to, to show their work while they're in their seat rather than standing up at a board and trying to talk to people. So that's how I've kind of ended up doing this. It, it works really well with sped kids, but also just everyone else. And there are kids that will like, oh, mister, can I, can I write the thing? Just because they, like, you know, they like to show their work and they like to, to you know, show things to the class in a, in a friendlier kind of way. Um, so that's kind of how I will use that. But again, that's only two or three kids, depending on what we do. So the biggest thing is sort of, you know, as I walk around, a little formative, just kind of see, see what they're doing, see where they're at. Um, yeah, and it's pretty obvious right away, the kids, that's just, staring at it or the kid that's you know done in five seconds so that's the main the main idea yeah so we have I mean student behavior is one of those things that it's not like a one-day thing it's it takes the whole year to get you know they need the routine they need the expectations they need all these things obviously you do the little you know spot you know put out little little fires and stuff um, I'm sure when they're being they will, they will be acting much better than they normally do. Uh, this class is pretty good though. But basically, um, we have a procedure that they follow for the most part, which is uh, sort of universal to this school. It's called DASH, right? So it's date, um, agenda, and standard, or lesson title, we don't actually put the standard, uh, and then homework. And so it is up on the overhead. Uh, it will be the same every day. Uh, we just change the little things. I have a template, and then there's a bell work. So they start off doing math, they start off working alone, so that sort of settles them down, gets them in the mood of doing math. Um, and then throughout the lesson, you know, we have certain times when they will be listening, you know, and I can gently remind kids if they're just talking or whatever, or do proximity, stand next to them. Um, and then when we have our group work, uh, I will usually put either a timer, I will put some sort of thing on the board, here's what we're doing, we are practicing, you are working with your table partner, you're working with your group, you're working alone, whatever it is, the reminder, and then here is what you will accomplish. The handout, number one through six, or whatever. And so I'll keep that on the overhead, kind of, first of all, to remind me what we're doing, but also to, to show the kids that this is an expectation. Depending on what 
the class is doing or how they're going, I may also put a timer up and that's always good to kind of keep them focused on, okay, this is the amount of time I have and then sometimes, you know, okay, I'm gonna choose some people to present at the end and so that motivates them a little bit better. Um, I mean, I'm sure it'll be fine if it gets, you know, if there's a kid who just can't handle, they can work outside, there's, you know, there's all the little strategies that you can go through from there, but these guys are pretty good. I think it'll be fine. So um, the main, again, the main idea is interior angles of a polygon. So the idea is, what if I have any polygon, any, any sides, any configuration, besides you know, overlapping, which is not a polygon, um, is there a, a standard way of finding those angles? Like no matter what they are, even if I don't know what their measurements are. So we're gonna start by just abstractly just drawing some polygons and just measuring them. And of course, that's not very accurate because you know, their angles are not gonna be perfect integers. Um, but then we're going to say, all right, uh, what other method could we use? What can we use from the past that we already know? So we know triangles add up to 180. So maybe we could chop one of these shapes into a triangle or two triangles or three triangles or four triangles. And that of course ends up uh, giving you the formula. We derive it from there. Um, and then from then it's just applications. How do you use that idea, that main idea of chopping a polygon into smaller polygons, the smallest polygon, of course, a triangle, and then uh, getting that formula and applying the formula in you know, other cases. So that's the main, main thing we're going to go through. Some students, <laughs> it depends. It's math, so there's always those that you know, just knee-jerk reaction, they don't like math, so you know, they, they have their problems with it. Um, I'm trying to bring in a couple more things to make it more engaging. Um, and again, you'll see this on the day, but I have sort of this animation that I made that is, um, what if I just screw this triangle up? Look at all the angles. Oh, look, they kill, they're still adding up to the same thing. Let's try it for another one. Um, at the beginning of the class, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly how I want to do this, we are going to have a little sort of hands-on thing where they, uh, in, in pairs or something, uh, draw those triangles or construct them. Triangles, rectangles, parallel, you know, all these different types of shapes and then measure their angles, so sort of a hands-on thing, and uh, try to generate those, those sums on their own. That's not gonna be very accurate, so I'm still trying to figure out the best way to, to get the, the work out of there, but that's how we're gonna try to kind of grab it, and then they'll be working together on the, uh, just sort of, you know, the problems after that. I get this question every single, every week I feel like. They're, they're kind of slowing down now, but you always get the, Mr. When am I gonna use this? And there are many options, many, many different paths you can take, and I have tried all of them. Uh, I try to show them a real life application, so I can try to show them, all right, you are, for example, in this lesson, um, we have a bench, and you are cutting the wood to create the bench. Uh, what is the angle that you would need to cut it if you have a hexagon, uh, you know, the, the bench part of the bench, and you have a hexagon and you want to cut it so it's sort of equally spaced, what angle would you cut it at? And then of course I get from the kids, well mister, I'm never going to make a bench. It's like, oh, okay, fine, but maybe someone else will, relax. Um, so that's, the, that's one of the kind of real world applications. In geometry, the majority end up being sort of building examples, like designing things. Um, for this chapter, I believe the the sort of overall goal that they talk about at the end is uh, designing a house and buying flooring for that house. So that's kind of the, the final project we're gonna do. So they will have to calculate the areas of rooms in, using the, those angles. Um, and then I think they get like, they like 30 grand and they gotta go online and research uh, different types of flooring and stay within a budget and stuff like that. So again, I will have kids that will deny that they will ever put a floor in a house, but you know, I've put floors in my house, so. It's a thing that happens. It's a thing you have to do. So, I don't know. We, we try. We try. <laughs> or you break down and you just say, uh, you need it for the next test. And, you know, that's the worst example. But, but for real life, we're going to try to try to bring it in as much as possible. And it's easier with math. Yeah. yeah. For, again, certain types of math. You get to the very abstract or complex, you know, algebra or things like that. And I can, I can give you an example but it is electrical engineering, it is impedance, it is, you know, it's something that you don't understand yet. It's a higher level physics question. It's something interesting, but not at your level. So I can try to explain it, but it's not gonna work. So I, I try to tell kids math is like a ladder, 
And in order to do many things in life, such as you know, get a medical degree or become a nurse or a pharmacist or you know, any, hard, any of the hard sciences, you need to reach this ladder. You may not need rung five, but you will need rung 10. And you can't get to rung 10 without rung five. So again, they don't believe me, but we try. <laughs>